to everybody, to the Royal Society this evening. And could I ask you, before we start, to uh, turn off your mobile phones, please? This is being podcast and uh, recorded and uh, everything else. And if you've had a chance to look at the adverts as, uh, as they've gone up, uh, this is the Royal Society's 350th anniversary year. There's a whole lot of uh, stuff going on. There are events that are uh, open to the general public and others. Uh, the Summer Science Festival on the South Bank at the end of June, beginning of July. The Local Heroes Programme running all over the country. Um, the uh, Partnership Scheme with Museums and Galleries. So look out for these. There are events all over the place in the 350th year. And there was also a new award this year for the first time, the Hawkesby Award, uh, given to people who support science, to technicians and um, teachers that help in schools. And uh, I think 10 awards were made at a ceremony, given, awarded at a ceremony here uh, quite recently. And Hawkesby was Isaac Newton's technician, so they were named after him. Um, so that was something new in this special anniversary year. And there's also a book, just to do a bit more advertising, uh, called uh, Seeing Further, um, edited by Bill Bryson with about 20 very interesting chapters covering, covering all sorts of uh, aspects. This is apparently selling well, and there are still copies in the bookshops, and you can probably buy one, or even from the Society, before they all run out. It will be in paperback uh, later. Anyway, those... Those are, are the adverts uh, for the evening. The main purpose of tonight is to uh, hear the Croonian lecture. Uh, this will be given by Sir Alec Jeffries, which is why you're all here, and it's a full house. The, um, a bit of history on Alec. He studied biochemistry and genetics at Merton College in Oxford. He then uh, took an EMBO postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Amsterdam, where with Dr. Richard Flavel, he was one of the first to discover split genes. He then moved in 1977 to the Department of Genetics at the University of Leicester, uh, where currently, 33 years later, despite many attempts to dislodge him, um, he still is, and he holds the position of Professor of Genetics and is also um, a Royal Society Wolfson Research Professor. Alex's research uh, in Leicester has focused on exploring uh, human DNA variation and the mutation processes that uh, create this diversity. He was one of the first to discover inherited variation in human DNA, and then he went on to invent DNA fingerprinting, uh, showing how it could be used to resolve issues of identity and kinship. And I'm sure that all of you uh, will have seen something of this work in the press, if not uh, in academic um, circles. His current work, and he's still doing uh, original basic research, concentrates on developing new approaches to analyzing variation and mutation in human chromosomes. So difficult stuff, but very important stuff. He has received widespread uh, recognition. He was elected to the Royal Society in 1986, and I remember this fondly because that's the same year I was elected. It's my claim to fame. Uh, he received a knighthood for services to genetics in 1994. He was awarded the Louis Jante Prize for Medicine in 2004, the Lasker Award in 2005, and the Heineken Prize in 2006. And he was also one of the four finalists for the Millennium Prize in 2008. So that's the speaker. Uh, the lecture, it's the Croonian Lecture, this is the Society's premier lecture in the, bio in the biological sciences. It's named after Dr. Kroon, uh, one of the original members of the society. On his death in 1684, he left a scheme for two lectureships, one at the Royal Society and the other at the Royal College of Physicians. And in 1701, his widow provided the means for carrying out this scheme and indicated that the bequest was for, and I quote, the support of a lecture an illustrative experiment for the advancement, advancement of human knowledge on local motion or conditionally of such other subjects as in the opinion of the president for the time being should be most useful in promoting the objects for which the Royal Society was instituted. That's what it says. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, the subject of tonight's lecture uh, by Sir Alec Jeffries is genetic fingerprinting uh, and beyond. I now commend him to you. Thank you. 
Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, uh, standing in the footsteps of some true titans of science that have given this lecture over the centuries. So I have to confess, I'm feeling a bit nervous as well, but there we go. Let's, uh, let's move ahead. So the story I'm going to be telling you today for the Croonian Lecture is a story of scientific accident, of fundamental research that purely accidentally came up with something useful. And that, of course, was the whole science of DNA-based identification. So I'll also be telling you a little bit about more, our more recent research of not just using DNA for identification, but trying to understand some of the processes that generate this huge amount of genetic diversity uh, that we all carry. But let's start off with DNA-based identification. Uh, young people, probably some of the young people here, will think, oh, DNA is always being used to catch criminals. There's nothing new in that. It's blindingly obvious. It's pretty dull. Well, let me tell you, uh, just 25 years ago, this field simply did not exist. The start of forensic genetics, though, is much older than 25 years. That starts with this chap, Carl Landsteiner, who discovered one of the first simple Mendelian genetic characters in man, the ABO blood group system. And in an amazing but totally unpronounceable paper, the uh, title of the paper is at the bottom there, uh, speculated back in 1902 that ABO typing could be used possibly to look at family relationships and possibly to identify people or exclude people from blood traces at the scene of crime. That was an astonishing uh, prophecy, an astonishing prediction that totally came to, to, to pass. So by the 1970s, 1980s, this was a very mature field using blood groups and other types of gene product variation to sort out family relationships and to carry out criminal investigations. So if I had been here 30 years ago, I wouldn't have been using the word DNA, or the initials DNA. This is the gobbledygook I would have been talking about, ABO, rhesus, MN, secreta, blah, blah, blah. These were all blood group systems. They're great systems, but they had serious limitations I won't go into. And with the wisdom of hindsight, which is a very dangerous sort of wisdom, it was quite obvious that the way forward was going to be with DNA. But we had to wait three quarters of a century before that became possible. My own group at Leicester and a group in California were the first to describe directly detecting variation within the DNA double helix, variation in terms of the precise DNA sequence. And the sort of variation we're looking at there was subtle variations at the level of individual chemical letters or bases in the DNA. At that time, very difficult to detect, very indiscriminating. There's only two different versions at a given base position, if you can find such a position. This really wasn't terribly informative. And we started thinking in the early 1980s that surely within this immensity of DNA that, that, that specifies a human being, there ought to be bits of DNA that were much more variable than this. And we started focusing in on regions of DNA that we call mini-satellites, which consist of a short sequence, typically about 30 base pairs long, of DNA, which is repeated over and over again giving you a very different sort of potential for a very different sort of variation, not in DNA sequence, but in the number of these stutters or repeats at a given position. So we got very excited by this. Uh, there were a few examples out there showing that these things really did exist, but we had no way of generically getting at these bits of highly variable uh, DNA in the human genome. Why did we want these? Of course, we have some very informative genetic markers, primarily for medical genetic analysis. So the true story of DNA fingerprinting and how to get at mini-satellites starts, of all places, in Maddingley, near Cambridge, at the headquarters of the British Antarctic Survey, who very kindly provided us with a lump of meat from a grey seal. Why did we want this? Because we were looking at gene evolution, and one particular gene we were interested in was expressed at very high levels in seals, making it rather easy technically to isolate the gene. So we then went through that gene isolation. We looked at the uh, human counterpart of that gene. Uh, this is the, 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 the uh, uh, so-called myoglobin gene. And we found tucked away inside the gene, one of these mini-satellites, that had the very strange property of being able to very weakly detect other mini-satellites in human DNA as if they were sharing some sort of DNA sequence in common. And DNA sequence analysis uh, pinned that down to a short patch of DNA, this little red patch here, which was shared very similarly across many different 
variable mini-satellites. So we thought, oh, if you want to get lots of these highly variable bits of DNA, all you need to do is to make a, a so-called probe, a segment of DNA consisting of just this red bit stuttered, and that should be really good at latching on to many, many satellites in human DNA. So our job was to isolate lots of super highly informative genetic markers at the DNA level for the medical geneticists. But before we did the isolation, we thought we'd better do one experiment to see if the theory was right. So we reacted this probe with a, what we call the southern blot, a, a membrane containing various DNAs, just to check that we could detect lots of variable DNA fragments. And that's what we did. And I'll tell you when we got this result. I can pin it to the minute. Okay, I know exactly when it happened, because this is the moment, my big eureka moment, this is the moment that changed my life, and subsequently has changed the lives of an awful lot of other people as well. This proved to be the world's first DNA fingerprint. So here we have a family group, Child, mother, and father, we can immediately see a sort of fuzzy barcode-like pattern discriminating all these three people apart. And you can see what appears to be a simple pattern of inheritance. This character in the child's coming from the father, this from the mother, and so on. So we could see immediately that the penny dropped within seconds. This was DNA-based biological identification and possibly using it for sorting out family relationships. And we also, on that very first experiment, purely by chance, had a whole series of non-human DNAs, including, of all things, tobacco. It looked like everything generated these DNA fingerprints. So we're then faced, very exciting, but we're then faced with two challenges. First, that's a mess. Can we improve it? And the answer, in a short time, yes. We were getting extremely discriminating, highly individual-specific patterns. These really were... DNA fingerprints. And let me just tell you that this group of people being shown here, these are not unrelated. That's dad and his 11 sons and daughters. All first degree relatives, all readily distinguishable in a single DNA test. Note how simple the inheritance is. So for example, this band in dad is inherited by some of the children and not by others. And then we have bands like this, which are inherited not from dad, but are present in multiple children. They come from the missing mother. Do we need mum? No, we can rebuild her by subtraction in that family. Don't need her at all. Okay. So at this point, we're fairly sure that this was going to be technology of real practical utility. The thing that amazed me is that within seven or eight months, we'd actually been asked to take on the very first case. It's an immigration dispute involving a young lad threatened with deportation from the country because he is believed not to be a son of the family, but instead a nephew to the family. So this is the first time DNA has ever been used in any casework anywhere on the planet. So here we have the mother. Here's a boy threatened with deportation. Three undisputed children in the family. And it is incredibly simple. This character in the boy clearly come from mum, present in one of the undisputed children. This character in the boy from mum, this from mum. This one, not present in mum, but present in two undisputed children. That's come from the missing father. It's as simple as that. Every genetic character in this boy matches mum or the missing father. He is a full member of that family. He is not a nephew, and we provided that evidence back to the Home Office, who promptly dropped the case against the boy, and uh, he was reunited permanently with his family. It's a really good news story to start off the story of DNA fingerprinting. Science beating bureaucracy. Not a bad start. Okay, that opened up the floodgates of publicity. Within a few months, we'd taken on the first paternity case, and then it was two insane years before eventually the technology went commercial with the founding of uh, Cellmark Diagnostics. And we have one of the founders sitting right in front of me here, Paul Devlin. So good to see you, Paul. Um, and that was a, a tremendous success. It also, it was a great relief for me as this technology was got off my back. We were the only lab in the world pretty well at the time who could do this, and we could see the whole thing going commercial. And it's quite interesting to look at the profile of casework that Cellmark processed over the first 10 years of operation. And the original volume work was immigration. That died away because there were only so many people trapped in immigration disputes. And then with a small lag, it was paternity casework that really took over. But the important point about this graph are the numbers up the side here. So within a short period of the basic discovery, here was a technology reaching out. These are numbers of cases touching the lives of thousands upon thousands of people and in a very deep and intimate and important way. And that was actually pretty awesome. So there are all sorts of uh, other things you can do with this DNA fingerprinting. I'll just give you one example from the world of conservation biology, and I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleague Esther Signer who did this work. 
Uh, this horrible looking bird is the Waldrap ibis, highly endangered, about 20 breeding pairs left in the wild in North Africa. Uh, um, uh, sympathetic people might say that is so hideous, just let it go extinct. You know, the world might be a better place for that. Well, bad thinking. Yeah, let's keep this, this species going. Lose a species, that's the end of the story. So Essa, uh, most of these birds are kept in captive colonies in zoos. So here are the DNA fingerprints produced by Essa of every single bird in Zurich Zoo. And why should she do that? Well, by peering at these beautiful DNA fingerprints, you can work out family relationships. You can put together the entire pedigree of that captive colony of Waldrap ibises. And why should you do that? You can look for bad things happening. And what did she find? She found bad things. So here we have mother bird, father bird. Here are their four offspring. This brother and sister have been getting together, and they've had four offspring in turn. Full brother sister mating, running a major risk of heavy inbreeding and all the serious genetic consequences that flow from that. So armed with this information that, that was provided back to the zookeepers who could then split the colony and minimise that risk of inbreeding. So that's a real practical application of DNA fingerprinting. So, so far, of course, I have not mentioned criminal casework at all, simply because DNA fingerprints are too complex for this. We had to simplify the technology, and that simply meant going back to mini-satellites and using DNA cloning methods, isolating individual mini-satellites and then designing methods to look at just one mini-satellite at a time rather than many simultaneously as we do in DNA fingerprinting. And if you do that, you can get far simpler patterns, sort of sort of DNA fingerprint if you like. These are DNA profiles. Patterns on X-ray film, just two bands per individual, and lots of variation between people. Why two? Because for most genetic characters, you inherit two copies, one from mother and one from father. These patterns are very, very simple. You could, take the, you could apply them to casework, you could take that evidence to court, you could explain it very simply to a jury, even the judge could understand what it meant, uh, and, and that, was, uh, uh, that, that was clearly going to be the way forward in forensic investigations, and indeed it was. So the first time this was ever deployed was in 1986 in my lab in a terrible case involving two young schoolgirls, both of whom had been raped and murdered, and a young man who had confessed to one of those two murders. So we were asked to look at the forensic evidence. I won't waste time going through this in detail. But suffice to say that we could detect trace amounts of DNA from semen from both victims, and the DNA profiles derived from the semen recovered from both victims uh, fully matched. Strong evidence that the same person had raped and murdered both of those girls. And the suspect who confessed to one of the murders was a complete mismatch. Nothing like the profile up here. Well, I didn't believe it. The police didn't believe it. We did a bunch more testing. And the final conclusion was that this was a false confession. This person was entirely innocent. And the upshot of that was that this young man was released. So the first time DNA was ever used in a criminal investigation was not to prove guilt, but to prove innocence. And without the DNA evidence, I strongly suspect this young man would have been convicted and would have gone to jail for the rest of his life. What the police then did was to believe entirely in the science, mounted a DNA-based manhunt in the entire local community, which eventually flushed out the true perpetrator, Colin Pitchfork, who is serving uh, two life sentences with a minimum tariff of 28 years for his crimes. Okay. That case was the birth of forensic DNA. Within a year, that technology has swept right around the world and been implemented by many of the major police forces and forensic laboratories worldwide. And it was good technology. In fact, it lasted as well into the 1990s, but we knew there had to be a better way forward. And the answer to the challenge of trying to get evidence, DNA evidence, from very small crime scene samples or crime scene samples where the DNA is so broken up that you can't get a a DNA profile, and that was provided by one of the, the more remarkable characters in molecular genetics, a chap by the name of Kerry Mullis, who came up with a truly brilliant idea, and that idea was DNA amplification. So what he showed was that you can make DNA make copies of itself in the test tube in a runaway or exponential fashion. Now, DNA's job, amongst other things, is to make copies of itself. That's how DNA is transmitted from generation to generation, and from mother to daughter cell. But what he showed in the test tube is you could take any chosen region of DNA and you could persuade that by separating the two DNA strands, 
To make copies, so from one molecule here, you've got two molecules of your chosen region. Separate that into the four strands of DNA. Copy, four double helices, 816 up to 1,000 a million, a billion-fold amplification. So you're sort of manufacturing the evidence. And it was immediately obvious, without saying, this is going to be the way forward. Extreme sensitivity. Tiniest trace, say, of saliva, or me just handing an object will leave DNA on it, enough to be able to type with this technology. And also opened up the potential for automation. So we saw this pretty well straight away, and we were asked to use this, or decided to use this, in what proved to be an extremely difficult case, not using mini-satellites, which are too big for this type of DNA amplification, but to go into bits of DNA that we call very unimaginatively micro-satellites, or simple tandem repeats, which are just shrunk down mini-satellites, with very short stutters and not too many of them. So these are much smaller than mini-satellites. So here's a microsatellite where the repeat unit reads GATA, so it just goes gada, 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 and the number of gatas varies from individual to individual, and that's very easy to measure by DNA amplification by amplifying up across here and looking at the length of the piece of DNA. More stutters, the longer it gets, the less, the shorter it gets. So we deployed this in, and I think this is the first case ever to use DNA amplification with uh, microsatellites, in a case that would have been absolutely impossible to tackle by conventional DNA fingerprinting or DNA profiling. And that was the identification of skeletal remains alleged to be those of Dr. Josef Mengler, the Auschwitz concentration camp doctor, and the subject of one of the biggest war crimes investigations and manhunts ever since he uh, eluded the Allies at the end of the Second World War. So what we managed to show in collaboration with Dr. Erica Hagelberg, who was a real whiz at getting DNA out of old bones, was that despite the terrible state of these bones, uh, exhumed from a grave site in Brazil, so that is not a good way of treating bones, sticking them in a grave site, tropical grave site. Despite their terrible condition, we could obtain tiny amounts of DNA and then compare the microsatellite DNA profile with relatives of Mengler, specifically his wife and son, in a sort of reverse paternity case. And that showed, this test shows that the paternal character uh, in the boy, not inherited from the mother, is shared by the bone, and ten other microsatellite tests, sorry, nine others, showed exactly the same result. The conclusion, this was Mengler, and that evidence, along with a lot of other evidence, was enough for the uh, German prosecutors to close the case against Mengler, uh, one of the biggest war crimes investigations in history. Now, of course, the technology has moved on. Uh, this is Stone Age technology. What we do now is to amplify not one microsatellite, but ten different ones at the same time. We type them, not by building in radioactivity here, but instead by building in pretty fluorescent coloured tags, so your PCR or your DNA products become nicely coloured labelled. Uh, and you also get rid of these horrible shadows underneath, which are sort of an artefact of the system. And if you do that, you get patterns like this. And this is exactly the DNA fingerprinting system in, currently in use in the UK. This is the information that the police will get from you if you are unfortunate enough to come to their attention and they require a mouse swab from you for DNA identification purposes. So here, the uh, 10 different microsatellites amplified up simultaneously. With, we've got one coded in green here, a nice yellow one there, blue, and so on and so forth. And you can then not only produce these patterns in an entirely automated fashion, but you can interpret them in an automated fashion as well. So the interpretation simply means converting information like this on an individual into a series of 10 pairs of numbers. So, for example, your first microsatellite, or STR, you might have uh, one version with 10 stutters and one with 12. So your entry would be a 10, 12. Second one, 9, 14, and so on. So your DNA profile is simply a string of 10 pairs of numbers. Easiest thing in the world to stick in a computer database, which is exactly what the UK did in the development of the first fully integrated national criminal DNA intelligence database established in 1995. So as I said, this uses 10 microsatellite markers, very discriminating, not discriminating enough. They will be increasing the number of markers in there. And the original idea was anybody uh, convicted of an offence would go onto that database, so if they re-offended, they could be speedily brought to justice. 
The size of the database now is absolutely gigantic. It's five, this is out of date. There's five and a half million DNA profiles on that database. The impact in terms of solving crime has been, in some instances, pretty dramatic. Certainly in the case of solid violence and sexual crimes, but even volume crimes like burglary and car theft, the detection rate has gone up quite significantly uh, since DNA has been introduced. Around about 70% of all tests, forensic tests carried out in the UK now are DNA tests. It's a technology of first resort. It really is quite remarkable. Does it work? If you get crime scene DNA sample just looking up on the database, you've got a better than 50% chance of identifying the prime suspect simply by getting a database match. So, great stuff. The police love it. But it's gone slightly off the rails over the years. Following a change in the law, Criminal Justice Act in 2003, the police are now entitled for anybody who has been arrested to demand a DNA sample which will be taken from them and will be stored on the National DNA Database for the rest of their lives, irrespective of whether they have ever been charged with an offence, never mind being convicted. The end result of that is we have one and a half million innocent UK citizens residing on that database. Now, I've always said that that is strictly out of order. This is discriminatory. In what way? 75% plus of juvenile blacks are now on that database. The chairman of the Human Genetics Commission is saying that some police are encouraged to go out onto the streets to arrest people just to get their DNA. This is very serious stuff. And I was delighted a year and a half ago when the European Court of Human Rights ruled on this that it was, put bluntly, it's illegal. It's in violation of Article 8 of the Human Rights Act, which guarantees each and every individual the right to a private and family life. The previous government have basically done nothing about it. All these innocent DNAs are still sitting there. So I was very interested to hear John Clegg, Nick Clegg, who's John Clegg? Nick Clegg. <laughs> I get confused with these new politicians. Nick Clegg yesterday said that one of the proposals was to tighten up regulations on the uh, use of that national DNA database. And I certainly hope that part of that tightening up will be getting rid of the vast, vast majority of these entirely innocent people from that database. Okay. What about other databases? Well, here's a somewhat out-of-date list of databases in Central and Western Europe. Uh, very simply, just about every country has got one. Um, there are a few exceptions. Italy hasn't got round to it yet. But if you look at the database sizes here, modest numbers here until you hit Britain. Okay, unbelievable. So in this, and I think the statistics are still about the same, it is somewhat alarming to be aware of the fact that 73% of Europeans who are on a national DNA database are Brits. Now, Britain is not responsible for 73% of European crime. Rather, this reflects the, the, the great vigour with which the previous government has sought to sweep people in to that database. Another sign, I think, of a database that has run dangerously out of control. So, interesting developments coming up. Now, there are other aspects to DNA. Databases are great for catching criminals, but you can also use, as we showed in the very first... Murder investigation, you also use them to prove innocence. Now, I think this is best illustrated by the American Innocence Project, established by two lawyers uh, back in the uh, 90s. In fact, two lawyers who gave us real trouble in terms of attacking DNA evidence. But they saw the power for exoneration. So the Innocence Project champions the systematic post-conviction testing of DNA evidence and has so far got over 200 long-term prisoners out of U.S. jails. A number of them rescued off death row. And I've actually met one, a person who's literally rescued from a gas chamber by DNA. And I can tell you that is a very emotional moment when you meet someone like that. So that is another important aspect of DNA testing. Other areas, mass disaster analysis. For example, the Asian tsunami, uh, the uh, mass graves in Bosnia, which are now being systematically investigated by the International Commission for Missing Persons, in trying to get these I remains identified and brought back to their families. And 9-11 with over 1,000 body parts from the Twin Towers being uh, identified by DNA. So, future, very briefly. Uh, what about getting your name out of your DNA? Well, there's a lot of work going on that. Unfortunately, it doesn't look too promising. You might think, name from your DNA? It doesn't have your name written in it. Well, to some extent, it does. For the simple reason that in 
our society and many other societies, your surname is strictly inherited down the male line, as is your Y chromosome. This is a chromosome that makes men men, carries the testis determining gene. So it therefore follows that there should be correlations between the surname and the Y chromosome that you carry. And for some rare surnames, that actually works out rather well. And it could be used, in theory, in a forensic context. But for most surnames, those correlations are very iffy. What about DNA identikit? Taking a scene of crime DNA, not getting the surname, but getting a physical read out of someone's appearance. And this is an area of huge current interest in human genetics, but really has not developed quite as well as one might have anticipated. So what can we do? We can do sex of an individual, red hair, it's a pretty good test, earwax consistently, a consistency, a splendid test where you can tell whether someone's going to have stiff or sloppy earwax, and that's about it. Okay? So all these wonderful speculations that you can predict facial features and, for example, the stature of a person, how tall they are, that we simply don't understand anywhere near completely enough the genetic basis of those complex characteristics. So this is all strictly in the area of, of science fiction. Of course, police would like to do this to get leads where they don't have someone on a database. But the alternative, of course, would be to stick everybody on the database. That, I think, is most unlikely ever to happen in the UK. But you might like to know that it is happening somewhere. The United Arab Emirates have started the mandatory databasing of their entire five million population, including citizens and other workers living in the country. So there's a very interesting social experiment that I, for one, will be watching very, very carefully to see how that pans out over the next few years. I think the really big challenge in DNA analysis is trying to speed things up to the point of getting an instant readout. Now, I mean, in theory, you can get this down to about 15, 30 minutes from a biological sample to some sort of uh, DNA-based uh, identity readout. But nobody yet has got it down to that critical interval of a few seconds. Because if you can do that, and this is totally science fiction now, if you can do that, you've opened up an entirely new world of using DNA in real-time security applications. And someone, sooner or later, is going to figure out a way of doing this. And that is going to raise some very exciting opportunities and some extremely dangerous threats, I think, uh, to, to our society. So th that's an interesting one to move through. So that's the end of the first part of the talk, um, but the larger part of the talk. What I would like to do now is to take you on to some more recent work, because all of this is applied science, but underneath it is the thing that drives me all the time, which is the pure science, trying to understand some of the, some of the most fundamental aspects of human genetics. And what are we trying to understand? Well, very simply, we're trying to get at least two great processes that drive, are ultimately responsible for all DNA diversity. Without these, we would all be genetically identical, we'd be clones of each other, and the entire species long ago would have gone extinct. You need this for diversity and for Darwinian evolution. So what are these two great engines? First, mutation. As DNA is transmitted from parent to child, it will occasionally pick up a change. This could be, for example, a single base change. So let's suppose we just have mutation. So here's one individual, here's one of his children's lineages, and here's another children's lineage, slowly building up these mutations, becoming more and more different from each other, the entire species fractured. So you've got to have something else. And the other thing that holds the species together is something we call crossing over or recombination, where as you inherit a chromosome from your mother and from your father, when you produce a sperm or an egg, depending on your, your sex, those chromosomes will exchange information that you're literally reshuffling the deck of cards of life. And it's this process that greatly increases the amount of genetic diversity in any, any sexual species. It also holds the species together as a cohesive genetic entity, and it's the reason why you have sex. Okay? Now, you might think, you have sex for some other reason. Believe me, it's for this. That's why you're doing it. It's to hold the species together. So we've been intrigued in trying to get directly at understanding these processes. But they're very difficult to analyse. So let's suppose that we took, say, a parent here, we looked at the ch a given base, our favourite base in the 3,000 million bases 
uh, in the human genome. Let's suppose we just looked at that base generation by generation, waiting for it to change, like this one. There's our favorite base. How long would we have to wait before we saw that base change? 1,000 million years. That's a long time. What about crossing over? Let's suppose that here are two adjacent bases. Let's suppose we're interested in a crossover that has changed exactly at that point. How long would we have to wait as we went down this long, long pedigree? Same number, 1,000 million years. That's a strange numerical equality in human genetics. So the two great processes basically run at the same rate. Now, that rate is so slow, it's obvious it's going to be bordering on the impossible to actually study mutation and recombination at this very fine scale directly. However, many satellites immediately gave us a way into thinking about new ways of doing this. You could pick up a mutation of mini satellites simply by looking at parents and children. So mother will transmit one or other of her two copies into an egg. Father, the same into a sperm. The egg and the sperm unite to create a child. If the child has, say, something that matches mum, but dad's copy is the wrong length, it's changed the number of stutters, that must be a mutation. A strange mutation that's changed the number of stutters in the mini satellite. And the great thing about mini-satellites, we don't have to wait a billion years to see one of these happen. Oh, no, no, no. Here we are. Here's, here's a small family, and here's a mutation. Dad, mum, six children. These are DNA profiles, so we see the two versions in dad, two in mum. Each child gets one or other from dad, one or other from mum. Except for this child, who's got the right thing from dad, wrong thing from mum. That's not a case of non-maternity. That's pretty well impossible. That's a genuine new mutation. But now we get stuck. What have we learnt about, first of all, these are very unstable bits of DNA. We can see them evolving in real time. But we're now stuck. What have we learnt about mutation in this man? Nothing. How can you solve that? Tell him to go away and have more children. Okay? So, go and have another 10 kids. Okay, well, yeah, still can't find any mutations. Go and have another 100 children. Right, go and have 1,000. Well, the biggest recorded paternal family or sibship in history was from a 17th century king of Morocco that f fathered apparently 900 children. A very busy chap indeed. Okay. Birthdays must have been a nightmare. But anyway, by the way, even with that, that's not enough. What we need are families of millions of offspring. Easy. Very, very simple indeed in humans. Let's see what we're doing in terms of picking up mutation. So to pick up mutation... What we're doing is looking at the child to infer what's happened in the egg or sperm. So we are using the child as a fantastically complicated, expensive way of amplifying DNA from a single egg and a single sperm. And as a father of two children, I can say, tell you it is complex and extremely expensive to do it that way. It's much cheaper to do DNA amplification at the level of a single egg or sperm. Eggs are very difficult to get. Sperm, without going into the obvious details, very, very simple to get. One ejaculate is 100 million sperm. Those are 100 million absolutely bona fide offspring that you've had as a man. Okay? 100 million offspring. And what we can now do is to use that approach to break through this small family number into numbers that before only enjoyed by bacterial geneticists and so on. And it really does work. So here, here's our family. If we take a man now and simply amplify about 100 sperms worth of DNA at a go... Most of the sperm don't carry mutation at this mini-satellite, but each of these bands here is a new mutation. So this man, we can work out the frequency of mutations in one experiment that takes about a day. That person would have had to have 1,800 children for us to get the same information. It's a very efficient way of doing it. And what have we learned from these approaches? Well, for microsatellites, the jury is still, to some extent, out. They're actually very difficult to study in terms of processes of mutation, but they probably change their number of stutters by encountering problems when DNA is replicated or repaired. For mini-satellites, the story is utterly different. Mini-satellite mutations arise as part of this sexual process of recombination. You do not see these mutations in, say, blood DNA. You see them quite specifically, for example, in sperm at very high frequency. And they arise by aberrant meiotic recombination. And that got us really interested in if the instability in a mini-satellite is caused by abnormal 
crossing over processes, recombination processes between chromosomes, is that something that is an intrinsic property of the mini-satellite, or is it conferred upon it from without? And the answer seems to be it's conferred from without. Because as we've shown, uh, by, again, direct sperm DNA analysis over the, the last decade or so, uh, that these crossovers are far from randomly distributed around along human chromosomes, or instead cluster into these very narrow hotspots. And it seems that occasionally a hotspot can generate a mini-satellite as a sort of parasite, bit of DNA that has latched onto this crossing over machinery and gets spewed out of the side of the hotspot, a bit like sausages out of a sausage machine. Okay, so these hotspots are very narrow, about 1,500 bases wide. They seem to be very common in the human genome. So who cares? Does it have any effect on human DNA diversity? Well, for the human genetics nerds here, I'm going to show, that time I showed some data, some real data from a study from quite a while ago. This is just to make the point that the impact that these hotspots have on patterns of DNA diversity is gigantic. It basically, remember, crossing over is like taking the deck of cards and shuffling them. It shuffles the genetic deck between generations. But by concentrating all your activity into these narrow hotspots, it's like trying to shuffle a deck of cards where great wadges of cards are bound together with a rubber band. You wind up with a really bad shuffling process. And that is the system the, 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 the human genome, for some perverse reason, has adopted. So what you see, if you look at patterns of DNA diversity, of these, these chunks of DNA where basically the, these think they're in an asexual organism. There's no evidence of reshuffling by recombination in the entire history of, of a human population. And then you get these abrupt regions here corresponding to hot spots where super shuffling has gone on. So basically, most of our genome doesn't know it's in the sexual organism. And that is pretty weird as well. Okay. So those are some of the things that we've been doing in recombination. So there's lots of challenges left, of course. Most of the time, when chromosomes come together and exchange this information, you get a, uh, in some cases, you get a crossover. But more often than not, the chromosomes come together in a strange embrace. Your mum's and dad's chromosomes, they embrace and kiss and then pull apart, and they leave a little kiss imprint on the other chromosome. That's what we call a conversion, transfer of a little piece of DNA. And that's something we're very interested in trying to understand this process. We understand quite a lot about crossover, the strange little patchy transfers of DNA between chromosomes. Very important, understand very little about the process. Another big question, hotspots. Why do we have all these... Uh, Crossovers focused into these very narrow hotspots, and what controls the hotspots? And that remained a complete mystery until three publications just earlier this year, or in fact just after Christmas, uh, given a clue which we're very actively following up at the moment. What controls the position of hotspots? Well, I should have audio now with a fanfare and a big roll of drums, because what controls it is our old friend, a mini-satellite. Quite extraordinary. It's the last thing on Earth I would have predicted. So here is a mini-satellite inside a gene. The gene makes a protein. The, when the, the information in the mini-satellite is translated into the protein, it produces a little sticky finger, what we call a zinc finger, sticking out of the protein. And that zinc finger feels along chromosomes. It looks for something it likes to stick to, and where it finds a nice sticky bit, it fires up a hot spot. So here's a very interesting situation where these hotspots, this fundamental process, we've now, the, the, the human genome has now invested basically all of its uh, uh, currency in this process in something which is coded by a somewhat unstable mini-satellite, which we know is evolving pretty quickly. So there's a weird thing. And actually, there's a good reason why it might do that, which I won't go into. But we're now left with a really bizarre world where we have a mini-satellite that codes through a sticky protein that fires up hot spots, some of which create mini-satellites, some of which could be things that regulate hot spots, and you wind up with an infinite regression. And at that point, my brain turns into a sort of grey sludge, uh, which means that there's an awful lot of stuff that we need to try and understand. Other areas, recombination can go wrong. Big time. So uh, if you have, for example, two copies of a given gene in your DNA, so here's one, here's another, sitting near each other, they can 
undergo what we call unequal crossing over. They can recombine, but the first gene recombining with the second, which alters the number of genes. So you can go from two genes down to one or three. A very important process causing a major burden on human health. Everything from colour blindness to, to, to many of the inherited anemias through to psoriasis. All this process plays a major role in all of them. And again, using uh, single DNA molecule technologies, we're now directly exploring aspects of this process. So we're learning a lot about recombination. We're learning about repeat DNA instability and how, in fact, recombination is the driver there. So recombination and mutation are, for that, different aspects of the same process. What about deletions and duplications of individual genes? So you could have a gene that gets lost. That's quite often seen in inherited disease. Or you could have a gene that managed to make an extra copy of itself. That is a fundamentally important process in evolution. When you acquire over evolutionary time new genes, you don't do it by inventing a new gene out of nowhere. Nature does it by duplicating genes, taking a copy, and then allowing natural selection to operate on it to create new functionality. So this is, if you like, the cradle of much of the, 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 the new genes that have arisen over millions or billions of years within our genome. Um, very recently, we've managed to show that you can directly detect events like this within our DNA. Tremendously challenging. Uh, the frequency of the events we're seeing at the moment correspond uh, in the ejaculate to about one or two human sperm in a single ejaculate carrying a rearrangement like that. So the challenge, particularly for our semen donors in these projects, is horrendous in the extreme. They really do work very hard to provide the titanic quantities of DNA that we need for these experiments. Jumping DNA, uh, that's a, uh, a, a, another challenging area. 40% of your DNA is made up of these funny little molecular parasites, these fleas that are spread around your genome. But paradoxically, actually seeing these doing the jumping has proved to be bordering on the impossible. So there's another challenge for the future. And another major challenge is going to be picking up the, at the most fundamental and subtle level of all, these single base changes within our DNA. These things that happen once every billion years, I think we can do it. We've already made good progress in that, uh, in that regard. So why are we doing all this? Right, here are a whole bunch of reasons. This is the stuff that we would put in a grant application. These are all jolly good reasons why this is important fundamental research to do. Everything from understanding human history right the way through to new diagnostics, right the way through to trying to understand how the environment might impact on your genetic stability and the sort of risk it might carry to the next generation. But while this is all true, and I could make the list 100 times longer, it's also a lie, because why I really do it is for one far simpler reason, and that is it's really, really interesting, and you never know what you're going to find around the corner. That's what gets me into the lab every morning, and that's why it's a huge privilege for me as a Royal Society research professor still be able to get in there and get my hands dirty, doing what I love most, which is messing around with small quantities of coloured liquid in little plastic tubes. Okay. Now, I'd just like to finish. That brings me, good grief, in time, much of amazement, um, to, to just one final slide I want to show you. Now, we've had more than our fair share of publicity over the years, and this is my favourite paper cutting, and, and it does have a serious point, even though it looks completely daft. So this is me. This is Monica Lewinsky. Bill, of course, is President Bill Clinton, and this is all to do with the semen stain on the dress acquired in the Oval Office, uh, and the testing, including some of our tests, that showed that that semen did come from the President of the United States. But more important than that, I think this is a daily mirror, is around the edge. Look at this really good science. Secrets of DNA, structure of the cell, the double helix, of how you get a DNA fingerprint, miles of miracles. That article was probably read by millions of people. As a university lecturer, I would impact what, 10,000 people in an entire career? That's getting science out to the public. And I think it's that more than anything else that's given me huge pleasure over 25 years in telling and retelling and re-retelling the story of DNA fingerprinting. Thank you very much indeed.
Aber ich zahle. Ja, schön. Uh, Alex has agreed to uh, answer questions. So uh, the procedure here is, if you want to answer a question, uh, put your hand up. There are two microphones which we will direct to you, and then don't um, stand up until the microphone reaches you. So we can have several hands, and then we can position the microphone so that the thing turns over quickly. So who would like to ask the first question? Okay, one here. Anybody else so that we can get a mic to you? All right, just think about it. If, for example, it's your research, how does your research end up in the hands which it has done, and how far out of your control has your research taken you? How far can it, any form of research, be go beyond the control of this person who's created it? Yeah, that, that, that's a really good question. The, the, so the question is... Um, I think you're referring to the DNA database uh, and, and what I see as some really quite serious abuses in the way that it's being used. I, I don't own the technology. I never have. Well, OK, we have patents, but that, that's by the by. The technology is far, far bigger than one person, so there's no way that I as an individual could ever control that. My, the only thing I can do is to stand up and make my voice heard, I hope, if I see things going off the rails, and that's certainly what I've done over the years. Um, and that's really all I can... Uh, together with an apology for the way that this technology has been abused, um, I can't say much more than that. Other than if you look more worldwide at the balance of good and evil being done by this, I think the balance is very heavily in good. I mean, it's getting rid of a great deal of uncertainty in civil and criminal casework. It's releasing people from jail. In some cases, they've been you know, in jail for three decades or more. There have been cases in this country of that sort of magnitude. So that there is great good in this, but there is also abuse, as you would see with any technology. Um, I do not take credit at all for all the good that's been done for it, and I would take a bit of responsibility maybe for the bad, but not wholly that. So sorry. <laughs> yes, one, oh, one then, one here. Thanks a lot for your talk. Very, very fascinating, as you, as you said. I wonder, um, you showed us different kinds of variation, um, like the hotspots or the satellites or the duplications. Um, and I wonder what you think is the most relevant for health. Which, which type of variation um, do you think is most uh, relevant in, in causing common diseases? Right. Well, there's, a, there's one fundamental law that governs DNA diversity and its impact on, on human disease. That's called Murphy's Law. It's what can go wrong, the human genome will go wrong, and it will cause a problem somewhere. You've got to remember that virtually... I mean, our, the population on this planet is so vast, that's 6 billion people, that's 12 billion... Well, 6 billion... Sorry, 12 billion gay meat. That, that if you can think of a genetic change, if it doesn't kill you, somewhere out there in the world population, someone will be carrying around with that, that change. So I think to try and single out any particular change and say that's more important than another um, is difficult. There are plenty of inherited diseases that are caused by just a single base change. Sickle cell anemia is a very good example of that. Just one base changes catastrophic consequences in terms of your haemoglobin structure and physiology. Other cases, there are diseases that, that, that arise because of rearrangements of millions of base pairs of DNA. Or indeed, you know, with Down syndrome, it's gained of an entire additional chromosome. So... It, it, it's, there is no, there's no simple answer. It, it, if something can muck you up, it will do, if that makes any sense. Yeah. One here and then Richard. Yeah. Hi. I suppose the, the biggest concern that uh, people would have regarding the DNA database is false positives and misidentification, really. Yeah. That's the problem. Um, could you talk a little bit uh, uh, to the, the sort of probabilities involved, why that might occur? Is it just experimental error, or is there a sort of fundamental reason why sometimes two people's DNA would match up when you wouldn't normally expect it? Right. Well, the, the, in terms of getting a complete match, the easiest way of doing that is, is to have an identical twin uh, that provides you with probably the very best genetic alibi you could have. So if you're going to go on a criminal career, make sure you've got an identical twin, because the defence is always, I didn't do it, my brother did it. Yeah, and that's actually happened in court. And remember, a criminal case has to be decided beyond reasonable doubt, and there's no way of dividing between. So uh, identical twins are pretty good if you, if you want to launch into a criminal career. 
Uh, but the database itself, I mean, the, it's, it's not just the fact that there are millions of people on that database, but every year hundreds of thousands or indeed millions of searches are done. Every new crime scene sample is put over that database. So the number of comparisons, pairwise comparisons being done every year is in the trillions. So when you talk about a, a 1 in tr a 10 trillion likelihood of you and me matching, multiply that up by trillions of searches, you're going to get matches out there. And indeed there are, to my definite knowledge, there are two examples of brother pairs who are not identical twins on that database who have exactly the same DNA profile. And that's been proved by doing additional DNA testing and shown they can be distinguished. As the... Uh, the, the, the current proposals move ahead to integrate the UK DNA database with all the European databases, the number of searches goes up pretty dramatically. And I think at that point, the number of markers, indeed I'd argue already, the number of markers have got to be increased. But then I think that this whole issue of a false match then comes back to the integrity of the database. Now, databases of millions and millions of bits of data will have errors in it. There'll be entry errors, transcriptional errors, and all the rest of it. So that also creates the possibility for adventitious matching. Um, what the scale of that is, I have no idea. And it's actually exceedingly difficult to interrogate a database to get some sense of, of errors there. Most of those errors, however, will be trapped out because there's always a second round of testing. So if you've got a uh, yeah, uh, uh, crime scene, sample matches, Mr. X on that database, there'll be a second round of testing. The second round of testing incidentally uses exactly the same genetic markers, so it's not really independent tests, but at least it goes uh, a long way towards trapping clerical errors within a database. Richard Dawkins, yeah. When you were um, de decrying the very, la very large um, police database in Britain, you kept on using the word innocent people. Yeah. And when you switched to talking about, was it Abu Dhabi or what, one of those, yeah. um, you seem to view with equanimity the prospect of a country having everybody. Mm. Um, and I tried to think, why would I object to having my DNA on a national database, mm. assuming that I'm not a criminal? Yeah. I could think of two reasons. One would be possible paternity cases. Correct. <laughs> Speak for yourself. I'm speaking, <laughs> I'm speaking in generality here. Yeah. Um, and the other would be that it might get into the hands of life insurance actuaries, um, which might affect my insurance premium for a I mean, there, there are sort of reasons like that. But when you get to reasons like that, then somebody who is not innocent, I mean, somebody who is actually guilty of some crime, mm. is surely entitled to some protection against paternity and uh, life insurance uh, claims. So right. why make such a big thing of people being innocent? Because it doesn't seem to make that much difference in those cases where any of us might mind. I actually wouldn't mind being on, on a, national, a national data. I'm quite interested to know whether other people would feel they're individual liberties threatened. Is there some way of legislating so that you can only do those sorts of satellite regions where, say, it couldn't be used for mm -hmm. life insurance yeah. purposes? Well, the, the, the current, yeah, I mean, these are all very good points. Let me just say that I'm not advocating uh, universal database. I merely gave uh, the United Arab Emirates as the first example of where that is going to happen. So in, in no way did I indicate that I thought that that was a... Uh, the way for right well why why would i as a private citizen be worried about with no criminal records and no intention of getting a criminal record of having my dna on that database it's the old argument from politicians in particular that, that, that if you're innocent you've got nothing to hide stick, stick your, your your dna on the database well there is a threat there so the, the threat is that these databases are imperfect there could be a glitch so the, the best i could hope for as, as I'm going to use words that I actually used to a, a, a Home Affairs Committee recently. The best I could hope for is nothing will happen for the rest of my life as my DNA sat in that database. That's the best I could hope for. The worst I could hope for is there's some glitch in the database that results in an erroneous match with me, which puts me right in the uh, frame of a major criminal investigation, causes untold chaos until the final DNA testing clears me from that particular investigation. That's a threat to me as an individual. Also, with familial searching, this ability to link family members together, it not only brings me into that threat, but also brings all my, my close relatives into that threat as well. So I think that's a real threat. It's a real threat of any database created by man that's going to be full of, full of errors. So that would be true of somebody who's been yeah. arrested for a trivial crime, who then goes on the database and one says that's legitimate, who 
then might be threatened in just the same way. Or a, or a, or a murder. Yes, I think there's... No, we, we need to get back to the idea that, that which people should be populating that database. And the answer to that, very simply, is, is people who have been convicted of, a, of, of a, at least some classes, if not all classes, of criminal offence. That, that was the concept right at the beginning. Even organisations like Liberty have never argued against that. Um, so, coming back to your point about health insurance and so on, you don't get that information from DNA profiles as generated. The DNA samples are indeed stored uh, in a repository, uh, but, but there's pretty strict guidelines about what you can and cannot do with those. So I think that's a, uh, with respect, that's a red herring. So, so health issues not there. Uh, paternity, there could be ways of getting around that by taking... Paternity only works if so you have a DNA profile, but you can take that 10 pairs of numbers... And you can encrypt them. You can scrunch them down into a personal identifier number from which you cannot get a DNA profile. That strips out everything other than personal identity. You've got no family relationship information, no ethnic origin information, no nothing. Just an identity number. Might be a way forward. Alec, as you uh, alluded to there... Um as well as actually individuals whose samples are in the DNA database, there's obviously information in there in terms of their relatedness, and it's now possible to identify potential suspects as relatives of individuals who are in the database. And you kind of made the point that you thought probably it would be okay for criminals to be in the database, but now, again, we're potentially identifying people who aren't in the database through people who are in the database. Do you have any concerns about that? Uh, well, it's, uh, yes, I do have because uh, the so-called familial searching has certainly been used in a, in a number of cases. It, usually, it's statistically rather, rather feeble. So the idea is you've got a crime scene DNA sample, you put it over the database, you don't get a match. So your perpetrator doesn't have a record or at least has not, come to, has not been DNA swapped at some time in the past. So you then put it back over the database and ask, can you find a close match? In other words, can you find someone who might be a close relative of the true perpetrator and, I mean, but one case that comes to the point where that approach was very successful was a case of the, the Yorkshire shoe fetish rapist. There's been a serial rapist who stole the shoes of his victims. Uh, semen from all his victims clearly matched up at the DNA level. It was, it was a serial perpetrator. Nobody knew who he was until a woman was arrested for drink driving. That's a criminal offence. She was DNA swabbed, went on the database, and gave a close match to the semen from, these, uh, from all these victims. Cut a long story short, it was her brother, and he was brought to justice. And so in that case, that was a very serious crime where I think there was justification in that dual usage of DNA. But then if you imagine the sort of flip side of that, of an entirely innocent Richard Dawkins, for example, being stuck on the database, and then uh, that being used to inculpate a close relative of his, uh, either falsely or erroneously, for possibly some minor misdemeanour, does raise a host of issues. One question, has this been ever debated in the House of Commons? Is it subject of any legislation? To my knowledge, absolutely no. So I think, again, it's a technology... That I'm, not, I'm not blaming the police in any of this at all. They will do whatever they wish within the framework of the law. The problem is the legislation, which simply has not caught up with the way that technology has been really quite imaginatively deployed over the years. Uh, so it's the law that's got to change. I think this may be... Uh, Madeline's this um, fifth row along. I think this may be the last question, unless there's a burning issue. <laughs> Building on fire. Um, there was a lot of publicity some years ago. Someone had sequenced the human genome. Mm -hmm. Now, you are showing... Um, it, probably was obvious from the beginning, there are lots of different sequences. So what did it mean, sequencing the human genome? Well, it, 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 sequencing the human genome was sequence a, sequencing a hypothetical so-called haploid construct of a human genome. But we've gone well beyond that. I think we knew right at the outset uh, that, that, that if you're going to sequence human genomes, you just don't do one, you do lots. So there's been a huge amount of work over the last decade characterising DNA diversity over many, many genomes. Uh, we're now into the world with entirely, or rapidly approaching, entirely affordable whole genome sequencing. So I'll make the prediction in five years' time, 
This will be the new cool Christmas present or birthday present for someone. Go and get your mouth swab and get yourself a complete genome sequence. Okay, so I think we, 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 I think we always knew that uh, there was a lot of diversity there and that the notion of a human genome sequence is, is narrow. Um, but I think the, from that diversity, we can learn a huge amount. And I'll just give you my favorite example, which is a publication of a miracle in science, and I don't use that word lightly, a few weeks ago, of an entire draft genome sequence of a Neanderthal. And what that showed, amongst other things, was that the Neanderthals have not gone extinct. So many of us are actually walking around with bits of Neanderthal DNA tucked away in our genomes. Quite an extraordinary observation uh, that could only ever have come through these essentially whole genome uh, uh, approaches to looking at human DNA diversity, something we would never have guessed at. So that, that's, yes, I think we're, uh, our knowledge of human DNA diversity and its origins and the way that natural selection can work upon that um, is, is increasing at a terrific pace. It really is the centre of a lot of activity in current human genetics. Exciting times. Well, having established we're all Neanderthals, I think that's no. probably a good, <laughs> good place Some to stop. Numbers, yeah. So I'd like to thank Alex for, Alex for a, um, a fascinating lecture, uh, something there for everybody. I think nobody probably even drifted off to sleep, the pace at which that was uh, delivered with great energy and gusto. And we, we got his, uh, his personal interest in pushing back the boundaries of the basic science as well as uh, all of this, which is what a lot of people will, will know him mainly for, uh, what's appeared in the, in the press. So anyway, a very... Um, very good job done. Now I have to present some things to Alec. So first of all, this is why, make sure I've got all the bits here. So here's your certificate oh, you to add much. to the other one you good have. Thank yes, you. right. Thank you very much. And here's a medal. Right. Oh, that's rather splendid. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. And the really important stuff. Oh, right. Okay. The check. Thank okay. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank, Thanks, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Can I... Okay, can, can, can I thank you all so much for coming along. It's, it's, it's just, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you've taken something from this. These, I, I'd like to thank the Royal Society for all the support they've given me over the years. It has been terribly important to me in my own career. These, these are all deeply appreciated gifts. I was hoping for a wig a la William Croon to cover my uh, <laughs> lack of hair. So you failed on that point, but uh, other than that, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.